I'm not really going to give this talk. I'm going to just speak more generally. Um, but I do have a somewhat prepared presentation uh, that I'll follow a little bit. Uh, my background is as an art historian. I got my PhD at Duke in 2001. I've taught various places in the US and most recently at the University of Amsterdam in the media studies department. And it's been really uh, a great experience for me to work outside of art history per se and work in a uh, different sort of department um, looking more specifically at the theories pertaining to new media uh, and how they pertain to art history and visual culture. My work has always looked at the historical intersections of art, science, and technology and to look at it really specifically from a different disciplinary focus has been really wonderful for, for my work and it's uh, really I feel like as though my research has really flourished in this context. And it's been great working with students also in this field, uh, uh, at least one of whom is in the audience tonight. So what I'd like to start uh, by talking about is a little bit about my background and motivations, why I do what I do, how I got into uh, researching and teaching about the historical entwinement of art and technology. Uh, as a small child growing up in the U.S. in the 60s, one of my most vivid childhood memories was the Apollo 11 lunar landing in 1969 in August. I was fascinated by the idea of space travel and rockets and the man on the moon, and I drew pictures and I had models and uh, I even had a little record uh, with uh, Neil Armstrong saying, one small step for man, one giant step for mankind, and I played it over and over and over on my little red record player. Um, I drew a picture of myself, a self-portrait of myself as a spaceman with a rocket ship in the background. I mean, this is so much of my early formative identity. And it wasn't really till much later that I came to realize how significant this was for me. So I grew up in the midst of of this very politically charged moment. I didn't realize all the, the uh, propaganda going on that I was being brainwashed by during the Cold War. I mean, this is a face-off between the US and the Soviet Union for military and technological domination. And I'm just like eating it up. Yeah, man on the moon. Yeah, NASA. Yeah, you know, United States Air Force. And um, I even had a poster it was a Snoopy's poster. You know the Snoopy's? And it was Snoopy on the moon with a flag saying, and, and it said, the moon is made of American cheese. Talk about cheesy. I mean, and, and this, is, this is what I grew up in, okay? So no wonder I'm warped. Anyway, alongside this fascination with technology and outer space and rockets and all this stuff, I was also deeply, deeply uh, affected by the environmental movement. There was a series of television commercials, uh, public service announcements, a campaign called Keep America Beautiful, where a Native American man would be walking on a, a landfill full of trash and a tear would roll down his cheek. <coughs> or he'd be rowing a canoe through a polluted water with fish belly up on the surface and a tear down the other cheek. And I, I, I grew up at this moment when there was, I think, a tremendous tension between technology on the one hand and ecology on the other. It was the time of the Vietnam War, which was a very technologically uh, sophisticated war. Um, it was brought home to television sets in ways that wars had not been brought home before. So this is kind of a tension that I grew up with and uh, I've, I've uh, retained these fascinations with technology and this commitment to ecology, to the environment, to the world that we live in, and try to wrestle with the tensions between them and the incompatibilities sometimes, the inconsistencies, uh, incompatibilities between them. So let's fast forward from 1971 to 1993. Uh, I started uh, working on a PhD in art history. I had exhausted all other options in life and uh, decided the only solution was to retreat to the ivory tower. I'd always loved art. I'd made art ever since I was little and, and really liked writing about it and seemed to have a knack for it. And so uh, 
1993, I'm trying to figure out my future as a scholar. I have to figure, I'm going to write a PhD. What's going to sustain my interest, not just for the number of years it took me eight to finish my PhD, but for a career beyond that? So I started thinking about the future and my future and art. And, and it dawned on me, it's 1994. The year 2000 is just around the corner. The World Wide Web has just come alive with Mosaic web browsers. I knew a guy uh, who started off as an art historian who was making interactive CD-ROMs. And I, you know, I thought, huh, this is really interesting. This is the future. My future, the future, the future of art. Maybe I'll be interested. Maybe I should become an art futurian, not just an art historian. Um, this didn't really uh, strike my professors in a very positive light. But they saw that there might be some merit in this, and they were intrigued. And so I began looking at the history of art in terms of how artists envisioned the future and used art as a vehicle for creating models of it in the present. This led me to look at, uh, in particular, the work of Roy Ascot. Uh, this is a piece he did around 1959, 1960, a change painting, which is reconfigurable. It's an early instance of interactive art where the boundary between the artist and the artwork and the audience seems to be blurred. The audience is encouraged to reconfigure. These are actually two different states of the same work. And the audience was encouraged to slide these panels across. They were set on grooves. So you could create different compositions with it and explore the, the infinite multiplicity or possibilities of, of the visual forms. Roy Ascot began doing this sort of stuff, uh, interactive art, reconfigurable art, things like that, and then got into cybernetics. Uh, and then started thinking about um, ways that people could communicate remotely with each other. Collaborations could take place between, say, Amsterdam and the Sahara with uh, someone also contributing from, I don't know, Australia. So these ideas were percolating at the time, the work of Marshall McLuhan and others, the, the idea of the global village, uh, media as an extension of man, things like that. So Ascot became one of the earliest users of computer networks among artists, uh, which he referred to as telematic art. Um, and he was very much interested in, in not art as an object, but art as behavior. This idea of software uh, as a metaphor for art. This is the first instance I know of any artist using the term software. Uh, it's not about this hardware, this thing. It's about an idea. It's about behavior. Jack Burnham was another key figure for me. He wrote a very prominent book called Beyond Modern Sculpture in 1968. The major theoretical and critical voice championing joining art and technology in the 60s. He also organized a very important exhibition in 1970 called Software. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a, bit, in a, in a minute. So I met Ascot in the summer of 94, and I read some of his writings, and I said, Roy, your work is so amazing, you know? But it's all scattered. I mean, how do how, people need to have all your work in one book? He said, I know, I know, and I've been talking to a publisher, but nothing seems to be happening. And I said, well, you know, I would love to do a book like that with you. And he said, OK, well, come visit me in Bristol, where Tom lives, and uh, we'll talk about it. So I went and visited him, and we spent days with him, went through his archives. And he said, OK, go do the book. I said, really? I just finished my first year of grad school. I didn't think I knew anything. But he had confidence in me. And several years later, this book was published. A uh, collection of Ascot's essays from 1964 to 2000 that I edited and uh, wrote an extensive 94-page introduction, which I felt was necessary in order to frame Ascot's work in a very uh, multi-layered context of the history of art and aesthetics, uh, Western and non-Western systems of thought and philosophy that influenced his work. Uh, and the history of science and technology in relationship to the history of art. Because there was not that history. It had not really been written. Uh, so in order for Ascot's works to resonate properly, that need, needed to be done. 
So Burnham had this great idea also that's influenced me a lot, this idea of art as a psychic dress rehearsal for the future. And so some of these ideas are, have been my guiding lights in uh, the work I do as a scholar and teacher. So this is the Telematic Embrace book and oh, uh, the cybernetic stuff. You probably all know a little bit about cybernetics, key principle being feedback loops that enable system to maintain homeostasis, to uh, maintain balance. So the output from a system then becomes an input that allows the system to regulate itself and not go out of control. And feedback loop became a very, very influential concept in experimental art in the 60s. I gave you a whole talk about that, but I, I won't do that tonight. Uh, cybernetics made a big splash in the art world around 1968. There was an exhibition organized at the Institute of Contemporary Art called Cybernetic Serendipity. And it included wonderful works like Edward Inodowitz's SAM, Sound Activated Mobile. So this artwork picked up sound and responded to the sound from the audience. Uh, and the construction of it is magnificent, this beautifully articulated kind of uh, spine-like structure. Uh, another piece in the show is by the first person I know of who got a PhD in cybernetics, Gordon Pass, who made a fascinating uh, system of mobiles. Some were sort of metaphorically male, some were metaphorically female, and they had goal uh, seeking behavior. The females had to kind of get the male and the male had to kind of get the female but the males competed with the males for the females and the females competed with the females for the males so you got this very complex system, systemic behavior from very simple uh, programmed foundations. These are uh, very important ideas in generative art uh, uh, today. Another kinetic piece, when inside cybernetic sculpture, also interactive to sound, which varied the vibrational rate of these poles with little uh, reflective discs on them with a stroboscopic light. Uh, they created some very interesting effects. Okay, I'm going to have to get go into a lot less detail. Uh, the main idea is there was a, uh, a real interest in two-way communication. Away from art is something that you looked at where there's a proper hierarchy from God to the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, down to the whatever. To a two-way model. So you see in Ascot's transaction set of 1971, the idea of the audience being involved in the change panes, the early ones where you reconfigured the, the uh, uh, plexiglass panes. Here you have two people really sitting, having in a, a real dialogical relationship with each other. This is just some sort of prop, some sort of motivation for interaction. It's like a game, but it has no rules. You make the rules up and the game up as you go in interaction with each other. Very different kind of conception of what art is or could be. There's a long history of artists' use of telecommunications. Uh, Laszlo Moholy Naj, the Bauhaus master from, uh, originally from Hungary, uh, did his telephone pictures in 1922. What he did was he called a commercial sign factory and using a grid with standard colors, he gave the instructions for how the painting should be uh, 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 executed. And it was very programmatic, very systematic, and it could be conveyed over a telephone line. Now this was really, really cutting edge stuff in 1912, 1922. He didn't make it with his own hand. I mean, it violated so many aesthetic principles of what art is. Uh, but Mahali Nash says, that's not what art is about. It's about this idea. And it can be conveyed over distance. It doesn't have to be you know, made in some studio with the artist's hands. That's nonsense. Bertolt Brecht, the German dramaturge, uh, wrote a very influential tract, the Manifesto, the Radio as Communications Apparatus, in 1932 amidst the rise of power of National Socialism, the Nazi power in Germany. He was very much afraid of the use of technology, radio in particular, as a form of propaganda, and his fears were uh, well-founded. He wrote that the radio would be the finest possible communication apparatus in public life if it knew how to receive as well to transmit, how to let the listener speak as well as to hear, how to bring him into a relationship of isolating him to make the audience not only pupils 
but into teachers. And you can see these ideas also in Ascot's work, this dialogical relationship, inviting the audience to become an active participant in reconfiguring, in reconfiguring a composition, so forth. So these ideas were percolating already in artistic circles, avant-garde circles in the 20s and 30s in different ways. And Brecht's writings uh, were very influential amongst artists working with video in the 60s. Uh, other precursors, mail art and fax art. Uh, so I wish I had more time. I'd love to go into more detail, but I can't. Uh, going back to that space race, uh, one of the key moments in the space race was 1957 when the Soviet Union successfully launched the Sputnik, the first satellite uh, to orbit. And uh, although the U.S. had been anticipating this, uh, it really was a shocking event. And President Eisenhower, the U.S. president at the time, created a special branch of the U.S. military called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, who, which was charged primarily with expediting the process of scientific invention in order to you know, compete now with the Soviets, which had demonstrated a certain superiority. Uh, one of the main projects of DARPA in order to fulfill its task was to create a computer network so that scientists could exchange information uh, discreetly and instantaneously. And uh, this began, it went online in 1969 with four sites. By 1971, there were 18 sites with substantial redundancy running from east to west in order to sustand, uh, withstand a, a nuclear attack. So uh, the internet, the World Wide Web, emerges out of the space race. It emerges out of this uh, competition between the U.S. and and uh, in the wake of Sputnik and the, the creation of DARPA. Now, artists wanted to use telecommunications for very different sorts of purposes. Uh, the Satellite Arts Project. Now, the satellite, I mean, this is what basically what, what Sputnik was. It's a satellite. Now, of course, we know satellites are used for telecommunications. Artists first gained access to them in the mid-'70s. Sherry Rabinowitz and Kit Galloway's uh, Satellite Arts Project joined performers on the east coast of the U.S. and the west coast of the U.S. doing music and dance performances with each other in real time, sort of, because there, is, there are delays known as latencies. It takes time for that signal to go from you know, Maryland up to the satellite and beam down to California. So they had to practice with that and use that latency as part of, part of the medium, as part of the system. Uh, Ascot was one of the first artists to use computer networking as an artistic medium. Uh, been used from around 1980. His landmark piece, La Plisseur du Texte, uh, took place in 1983. Excuse me. Uh, and it involved 11 nodes across the U.S. And it was basically a collaborative storytelling project, a planetary fairy tale, where each of the nodes took on a certain character the princess, the wizard, the king, the prince, the, the uh, I don't know, the evil anti-hero. And then they played out these roles through the computer network system. Uh, it was limited to ASCII text, so the only sort of imagery you could get were these ASCII images, which have since become, well, they've had a resurgence of popularity, they're kind of retro chic. Uh, it, some nodes played this out very performatively. So in Sydney, for example, uh, individuals dressed up in the attire of each of the roles, and then they would read out this growing uh, piece. So it's sort of like uh, the surrealist game of the exquisite corpse, the cadaver skis, where you start a drawing, and then you fold it over, and the next person only sees the end of it, and then they start from that, and they build something, and then they fold it over, and so on. And at the end, you get something that no single mind could have possibly come up with on its own. Well, you can imagine this taken to a different sort of extreme using a computer network where people are exchanging things. You don't know what's coming next. You don't even know if your thing's going to be next. Someone might sneak something in before you. But this, this thing evolves. And it's not so much what you get at the end of the day. It's more about the process of creation, the process of people all over the world participating, collaborating together as part of a kind of a, 
a single consciousness that emerges from these interactions. That's the theory behind it, Ascot's theory of telematic art. So, as he writes, telematic art meaning it's not created by the artist, distributed through the network and received by the observer. It's the product of interaction between the observer and the system, the content of which is in a state of flux, of endless change and transformation. Uh, Jack Burnham's software exhibition in 1970 uh, was uh, one of the first opportunities the public, the general public, got to experience uh, information technologies directly. It was the first exhibition I know of that really made use of a computer for real-time processing as part of the exhibition. Uh, on the cover of the catalog, and this was designed to be like Life magazine, there was so much pre-publicity, and actually the show was kind of a flop. The computer didn't work. Uh, ironically, due to software problems, Burnham <laughs> claimed the gerbils in this. This is a piece that was done at MIT by Nicholas Negroponte, the brother of, oh, what is ever his name? He's like the head of something in the US, kind of a creepy guy. Nicholas Negroponte wrote for Wired Magazine. He was the founder of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, and he's one of the, the main people behind the one, $100 laptop project, really uh, interesting guy. Anyway, this is a reconfigurable environment made up of little blocks with gerbils inhabiting it with a robotic arm that moves these blocks and it tracks the motion of the gerbils and then it changes the environment in response to their movement. So you can envision this as a model for a reconfigurable human environment that tracks how people move through urban spaces or rural spaces and then reconfigures those spaces either for maximum efficiency or, or however, however it's reconfigured. So this is, re I mean, this is really cutting edge stuff, 1970. Anyway, another disaster, the gerbils, they didn't know much about gerbils. I think they put male and female gerbils together and it was just a disaster. <laughs> Oh, uh, well. <laughs> yeah, they could have known better. Anyway, as, uh, Burnham came up with this wonderful concept, theory of systems aesthetics, that he spelled kind of in a funny way. The point that he made in this that I think is important to, to note now is we are now in a transition from an object-oriented to a systems-oriented culture. Art does not reside in material entities, but in relations between people and their environment. Uh, this particular essay, since the early 90s, has become uh, a very central for a lot of re-theorization of contemporary art. There's been a real proliferation of literature that cites this, that, that, uh, that uh, sort of exhumes Burnham and his theories from the rubbish heap of history. Uh, and that's been one of my prime aims in my own scholarship. He was an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily brilliant and uh, uh, prescient thinker. Uh, one of my favorite Burnham moves in this wonderful article called Alice's Head in reference to Alice in Wonderland. So he's talking about conceptual art. He says, conceptual art's ideal medium is telepathy. I mean, you can't say these things today, but in 1969, <laughs> you can get away with it in, in art forum. But he, what he did was he starts off uh, the article with a little quote from Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. He says, well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat? It's the most curious thing I ever saw in all my life. Now, why does Burnham begin this article on conceptual art with this quote? Well, he's drawing a parallel between the grin without the cat and conceptual art, which is like the art without the marble, the paint, the canvas, the, you know, the materiality of art. Really, really fascinating. Uh, he worked with computers himself at MIT in 1969, uh, 68, uh, as a fellow, as a fellow at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, and these ideas uh, were incorporated into the software exhibition. Key idea: a dialogue evolves between the participants, the computer program, and the human subject so that both move beyond their original state. This idea that these computers, these machines, are not just dumb objects, that we have a relationship with them, we interact with them, and they interact with us, and we both 
we both change as a result of that process. I mean, you can uh, maybe think of this as a, a precursor to Bruno Latour's actor network theory. These are not just objects and human things, it's discrete things. We're all part of a system. We all affect each other. We all are actors in, this, in these networks. Okay. Uh, one of the key ideas in software, the software exhibition, was not to differentiate between technological art and non-technological art. And some of the technological art was uh, very theoretically sophisticated, and some of the more conceptually oriented art that was not technological could be interpreted in very interesting ways uh, using computer metaphors, this idea of software as a metaphor for art. So for example, Joseph Kossuth's seventh investigation, Art as Ideas Idea, Proposition One. Joseph Kossuth being one of the most philosophically profound artists uh, of our time. Uh, if you read this closely, you see a series of propositions. One, just, just listen to this as I read it to you, okay? And try to follow these instructions. Assume a mental set voluntarily. Shift voluntarily from one aspect of the situation to another. Keep in mind simultaneously various aspects. Grasp the essential of a given whole. Break up a given whole into parts and isolate them voluntarily. Generalize. Abstract common properties. Plan ahead ideationally. Assume an attitude toward the mere possible and think or perform symbolically. Detach your ego from the outer world. Uh, I argue that Kassuth's operations, uh, Kassuth's propositions operate like instructions, like code, like software in the mind of the viewer. You are being taken on a series of commands in your own internal uh, processor. They function also, I think, as a meta-analysis of the phenomenological and linguistic components of meaning, just uh, linguistically and phenomenolo uh, phenomenologically. And they, they also demand on a metacritical level that the viewer examine the process of processing information while in the process of doing so. How are we doing for time? Okay. Another area of my research that, uh, that concludes the software section. Uh, another area of my research that uh, is very interesting to me, the scientists, uh, engineers, designers, working together. Uh, this should be moving. There we go. And I'll just read you a couple quotes. One by Florian Schneider that I think is really, really fascinating. Collaborations are the black holes of knowledge regimes. They willingly produce nothingness, opulence, and ill behavior. And it is their very vacuity that is their strength. It does not entail the transmission of something from those who have it to those who do not, but rather the setting in motion of a chain of unforeseen accesses. I think this is a beautiful way of thinking about collaboration. Uh, and I have argued, I think, in a much straighter tone of voice, that transdisciplinary teams generate insights and produce results that could not have been achieved by using the methods and techniques of any single discipline. They create hybrid pro end products that could only have been imagined and executed as a result of collaboration. Oh, we can skip that. It's uh, just more pro-collaboration rhetoric. Uh, more pro-collaboration rhetoric. <laughs> um, but I believe it. I believe that such research is of crucial importance as an engine for innovation. Uh, an innovation not just as an immediately marketable commodity, but as, a, uh, but as constituting more subtle and perhaps more insidious and profound shifts in the conception and construction of knowledge and society. I don't know if any of you got to see this. It was in the oh, Saudi camp, I think. Jeffrey Shaw's uh, T Visionarium. Yeah, it was there, I think, last fall, last October. Remarkable installation where you, there's a database of videos, and uh, you can use a controller, and 
really explore. It's a tremendous interface and technological achievement. Exploring these videos, creating your own mixes, things like that. Uh, it helps you go through it, selecting different qualities or aspects that you want to focus on and seeing things that are like that in this database. Okay, now what I really wanted to talk about was my newer book, this one, Art and Electronic Media. I can pass this around. Uh, this was published last year by Fiden Press. I've been working on it for years. And it's uh, a survey of art and electronic media uh, from the beginning of the 20th century to the present. Uh, it's part of the Themes and Movement series. There's a whole series of books that follow this format of land art, minimalism, uh, pop art, arte povera. There are three sections of the book. There's a survey section. Uh, with 28,000 words and a bunch of reference images. The center section has a lot of color plates with captions that describe them. Uh, and then there's the document section, which are critical essays that I selected and edited, written by other people, that were in, you know, very important forming this. And I have, to, I have to back up and say, you know, I mentioned when I wrote this lengthy introduction to Ascot's book that there was really nothing written about it. And there had been things written about it. Burnham's book, for example, and things here and there. But uh, this field of artistic inquiry, which is really many fields, I mean, there, there are things in there that uh, you could hardly bring them together. But uh, because they don't fit anywhere else, they kind of end up jumbled in, in this strange t uh, title, Art and Electronic Media, which was the publisher's title, not mine. Um, there is no established canon for this area of artistic production. Uh, it's generally not accepted by mainstream art historians, mainstream contemporary art discourses. When you go to the big biennales internationally, you do not find much of the work uh, in the field in those exhibitions. So it was very important to me to create a survey that was very comprehensive, very international, that represented uh, uh, a broad span of years with uh, representation within those years that was adequate, um, and it was a very difficult juggling act to essentially curate uh, this uh, survey um, and to try to make a case for why this historical set of practices demands greater recognition, greater canonical acceptance as part of the history of art and visual culture, which it really struggles to uh, gain. Uh, I didn't want to organize the book in a simple chronological manner. It didn't make sense to really focus it on the particular media that artists used. Rather, I was very much concerned with trying to think about it thematically, to show continuities across historical periods, across the use of various media, and so forth. So I invented these sort of subjective streams, seven of them. So it's not strictly chronological, it's not medium-based, but the goal is to enable the rich genealogy of art and technology in the 20th century to be understood and seen, literally and figuratively, not just as a quirky and marginal activity, but as central to the histories of art and visual culture. Oh, and Roy thought quite highly of it. Uh, here's uh, the contents of the book. And I, I just want to skip ahead to show you uh, an outgrowth of this. This started. Uh, Summer of 2009 at the University of Bremen, Department of Informatics. I was invited as a guest researcher and professor there, and I worked with a group of students. And we created an online companion to the book. So, you know, a book is a great thing. It's a fabulous interface. It's reliable. It always stays the same, and that's a blessing and a curse. It's stuck in the form it is. Very difficult to change. And once you change one, well, all the other ones still stay the same. Uh, and it always ends where the book ends. With an online resource like uh, the Art and Electronic Media Online Companion, ba -ba -da -ba, um, you can always add to it. And this is an open format where anyone can register to become a user, create content, and submit it, and uh, pending editorial approval, get it published. Let me just uh, back up. I'll just show you the main site here. And then I'll just take you through a couple uh, 
entries that are particularly sound oriented. Maybe I'll come back to the front page in a minute. So this is a piece, and I've used this in my teaching. It's been great to be able to teach my book and to use this online companion as a forum for student work. So, and of course, I taught in the spring at UFA. We uh, students generated literally hundreds of entries. So now the content in the online companion exceeds that of the book, and it's growing, and it's more contemporary, and it involves sound and video, like uh, this wonderful piece by um, what's the guy's name? Gerald. We'll, we'll just look at it. Luke Jerome. So normally, we only see the rise and fall of the tides. We only see gravity by the rise and falls of the tides. What he did was he created an installation that allowed gravity to be heard. So the... Uh, in this installation, there are the crystal bowls that are spinning, and the sound of something rubbing on them generates this, this ringing. So it's an, it's an acoustic sound generated live. The subtle variations in the gravitational field are sensed by sensors in that environment, and they alter the water level in those jars. So the pitch changes, in response to changes in gravity, which is always changing, and uh, you hear it. Uh, because the gravitational field, I think, is slightly different. How does this work? I think it's slightly different in each, each one. And when there's a point at which they equalize, uh, the transition between high to low tide, they harmonize with each other. Really beautiful piece. I'll show you another quick piece. This is a piece called Shanghai by Trimpin. Uh, and this is based on the ancient Chinese instrument, the Sheng, which is a reed instrument with bamboo pipes. So the artist has created this disc with holographic uh, print on it, and it spins, and it's read uh, by a, an optical uh, sensor, and then that varies the sound that goes through these reeds uh, that are in uh, buckets of water. Maybe we can forward through this a little bit. You can actually see it. I'm going to show you those reeds. So, one of the things I love about this piece is, is the combination of an ancient Chinese instrument that's uh, recreated using, uh, you know, optical sensors and holographic images, and then sound generated using very ancient means, these uh, reed-like structures uh, and wind. So uh, that's really all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. There's a hand in the back. Yeah. Being very much a, um, a marginalized thing. 
Yes. Um, and your quote said that it was uh, actually very much an important part of both visual culture and art history. Yeah, that's my quote. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that, that's yeah. your quote. Cool. Um, I, I'd actually really be interested to hear you maybe comment a bit further. Uh, you know, some people say that after the 50s, music kind of like lost its way and people lost touch with it. And it just became music for musicians. Um, and I feel like with art, it, it's a very similar path. Um, but, but you think that it's still very vital and still very um, connected to the whole scene. Uh -huh. One of the interesting things that's happened in the art world is that, well, there is no single art world, but there is an art world that calls itself the art world and is known as the art world, and it's the art world of the international biennales, the Tate Modern, the, uh, the big galleries that advertise an art forum, Art Forum, Freeze Magazine. Uh, there are you know certain art history departments, like at Columbia University. Okay, so there are certain, there is a definable art world and it's an art world that has a market and a resale market. There is no market, there is no resale market for art electronic media. Um, but what has happened over the last 20 years is the emergence of an extraordinary autonomous infrastructure to support new media art. So you have the emergence of places like the ZKM, Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, Germany, which has its own museum, which uh, had a, a, a very powerful, uh, important fellowship program where people created works there. They produced fabulous exhibitions and catalogs, uh, really good scholarship. Uh, other places like Ars Electronica, since 1979, annual festivals, exhibitions, conferences on uh, electronic art, new media art. Um, in the U.S., the proliferation of this has taken place primarily within universities. There isn't the same sort of public funding. So, especially within the University of California system, you see very prominent people in the art and art, new media art world as professors or departmental chairs of university departments. So, electronic art, new media art, has gained a certain momentum and a certain power a certain presence, its own inf institutional infrastructure. The greatest number of hires for faculty positions are in new media. They're not in sculpture. They're not in painting. They're not in you know, 2D, whatever. They're in digital art. There's a demand from students for this. So I think you, ha you see things changing really dramatically in the domain of visual art in support of these sorts of practices. So in many ways, you cannot really consider them marginalized, even though within the art world and the art market, they are extremely marginalized. And you won't get, you won't see much written in places like Art Forum and Freeze about the stuff that I write about. Uh, sound is a difficult issue. Um, sound can claim to be much more advanced in using electronics and new media technologies than visual art was, in, certainly in the 50s. So, you know, fabulous soundtrack for Forbidden Planet. You know, you won't find any parallel to that in terms of its accomplishment in electronic art at that time. Um, I don't. Uh, every time I talk about this, people ask about sound, and I try to incorporate sound in my own work because I think it's so important. So I talk about the extraordinary importance of, of people like John Cage. Uh, in developing and, and uh, artistic discourses, really central aesthetic ideas for visual art. Um, and there are very key individuals, people like, uh, oh, I'm blanking out now. I think that there, I think that it would be very beneficial for there to be much more conversation between the electronic music world and the electronic art world. Uh, and I don't see that happening as much as it, it, as it could or as it should. And I think it's partly difficult because it's hard enough to become an expert in one, much less become an expert in other, or to even communicate that expertise across disciplinary boundaries. But I think it would be really valuable to do so. And uh, hopefully, you know, that kind of conversation happens at moments like this where Stein invites an art historian to come talk about electronic art.
Um, but uh, I think the conversation needs to be much more directed and focused. Yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, that piece that I showed from the Cybernetic Serendipity Exhibition in 68, the piece by Gordon Pask with the male and the female forms, I mean, you have emergent systemic behavior from very simple programmed uh, instructions. Uh, and there's quite a bit of that, uh, even in the early history of art. So there's a piece called First Tighten Up on the Drums by Norman White, which is essentially a cellular automaton. This is from 19... 1968. Uh, and a lot of artists have worked with this in various ways. Uh, Michael Gray, for example, started working with uh, genetic algorithms around 1989, uh, doing some of the first artwork uh, using artificial light and things like that. So uh, that is uh, kind of a vi it was a vibrant area of artistic research. There's a long history of generative art. Uh, the roots of computer graphics, uh, in many ways, are involved in generative art. So people like, and, and a lot of this happened in Europe, particularly in Stuttgart, Germany, where Frieder Naka was a student of Max Benze, the philosopher of, of, uh, of uh, information aesthetics. And Naka, with a background in mathematics, started writing algorithms that generated visual forms. So uh, it's really at the roots of, of uh, computer art. Uh, uh, you can't really separate generative art from computer art in significant ways. I think I still don't really understand what the central point is because I think there's some inconsistency in the things you were saying. Um, why is you, you refer to stuff like electronic media or new media art? But at the point you say um, that at some point you have to distinguish between the material form and the concept. And then if you are defining the type of art by the type of material used, like computer or electronics or whatever, then don't you see that as some kind of inconsistency? Yeah, it's a tricky problem and a slippery slope. Um, <coughs> one of the problems uh, and this came up at a panel discussion that I organized at Art Basel uh, with Peter Weibel, who's the director of the ZKM in Karlsruhe, and Nicolas Bouriot, who's a French curator and the theorist behind relational aesthetics. And uh, there's this also this concept of... Uh, Post medium, the post medium condition theorized by Rosalind Krauss. So there's this idea well, why bother talking about media anymore? We're in a post medium condition. Well, the reason we have to talk about media, whoops, the reason we have to talk about media is because art historians like Rosalind Krauss and curators like Nicholas Buriod will say, well, we don't have to talk about media anymore. We're in a post medium condition. But then they don't show any works of art that actually use electronic media. So if you don't talk about media, you get excluded. And if you do talk about media, you get excluded. But how are you going to talk about why you're being excluded if you don't call attention to the basis for that exclusion? Excluded from what? Excluded from the exhibitions that Buriod curates, well, if the journals that Rosalind Krauss edits. Because the analysis is not restricted to what this commercial art world is thinking about to the art itself. Well, that's what the that artists do. Matter. That's what the artists do. I, as an art historian, have a different sort of fight. So uh, the history of art is not set in stone. It's malleable, and it changes. When I was a student in, in college, the standard art history book that we used, Jansen's History of Art, had no women in it. Not a single woman was in that book. Well, in the wake of feminist art criticism, uh, that has changed. The canon of art history has changed under, under this doesn't work anymore. We have to reinvestigate the history of art 
we have to correct this oversight in fact there are some really very important women artists that belong in this can no i'm not talking about an art world in a narrow sense i'm talking about the canonical history of art that every college student reads in their first survey of art history course that is a very fundamental source of knowledge about what art is and that needs to be addressed in a serious way you can't pretend to exist in a vacuum in an art world if the rest of the world doesn't acknowledge that what you're doing is art it doesn't have any impact for example the copyright law if the copyright law says you produce a work with a very abstract definition with no reference to what any medium whatsoever if you would have had a computer in 1890 and have produced software on it you would have qualified for copyright and even if you would have been a woman regardless of what the official art world or market would have thought about that there were still scholars thinking about art uh, in a much more general way than this art world in a very narrow way was. But then I, I, I still think it's very inconsistent to talk about this restricted art world and then criticizing it and making the same mistake by using a reference to uh, a particular type of medium instead of looking at art as an abstract concept. Well, I, I do look at art as an abstract concept, and I think, that, I think that I think that uh, you heard a lecture tonight in which I discussed art that was technological, but not necessarily primarily on the basis of its technology, but more on the basis of the ideas behind it. So I don't think that the claim that you're making is really justified. Are there other questions? by telling you a bit about uh, the ideas I have for my project, uh, which centers around the Enigma cipher machine that was used by the Germans and the Japanese in World War II. Um, I think it was about a year ago I started, I, I learned about the machine somewhere and started thinking I wanted to do this project. So I thought this seemed like the perfect um, device to use for such a code uh, ciphering, deciphering machine. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you a bit about the machine for those of you that don't know about it. Um, it was developed in the 20s, um, initially as a solution for, I think, commercial business uh, corporations who wanted to keep information secret, uh, transmit it, obviously without a third party being able to understand. And it was quickly adopted by the Germans in World War II with some adaptations to make it more secure. Um, I have a couple of photos. <coughs> you can see what it looks like. Yeah, there are those guys getting <laughs> getting the job done. Um, the machine looked like this. It was very simple, self-contained in a wooden box um, consisting of a typing keyboard with a set of lamps on the top. So uh, someone would type in the, the letter here and the encrypted letter would light up here and then they would transmit that. Um, a set of rotors, which I'll explain more about, and then a plug board, which added another layer of security. Um, a top view, <coughs> like this. Each of the rotors was adjustable. Uh, there were 26 settings, one for each letter of the alphabet, on each of the rotors. Um, the rotors themselves looked like this. Basically what happened was, um, when a key was pressed, you can see that there are diodes on either side of the machine, or on either side of the ring, the current would pass through one, go through the sort of random wiring, and then come out on the other side um, and pass on to the next rotor. Um, the next rotor might be a different letter, so in this way you would get a more complex cipher. If you were to use only one rotor, you would get a simple substitution cipher, so A would always change to X or something like this. But by combining with three and then later four rotors, they were able to create a polyalphabetic cipher. Um, with four rotors, I think there were almost half a million possible alphabets. And the alphabet changed with every keystroke because what happened was when you typed a key, rotor one would automatically turn one time. 
and so on. It would keep turning until it had turned all the way around 26 times, and only then would rotor 2 turn, and so on down the line. So, yeah, I think... Sorry? But I copied this from Wikipedia because it's a bit complicated, so I have to uh, make sure that I understand what I'm saying. Basically, the, and this was one of the weaknesses of the cipher, um, any time you have a cipher, you have to have some kind of a key, an encryption key, so that the person on the other side can recreate the settings to decipher the message. Um, so the Germans used uh, a code book that was based on the date. So every day, there would be a different ground setting. They would look, they would find the ground setting, set the rotor wheels to that four-letter combination. It didn't matter what it was, A, H, O, U, or something. Then they would randomly choose, the operator would pick his own thing, um, he would randomly choose a three-letter word uh, or set of letters. He would type that into the machine, and then the encrypted letters would come out. Then he would reset the rotors to the encrypted letters and type the message. When it came to the other side, they would type in the first six characters, and then they would find the keyword because it decrypts automatically. Yeah. Um, there were some weaknesses as well, that being actually one of them, the fact that they always typed the first word twice. And that gave the initially the Polish cryptanalysts that broke the Enigma code um, initially were able to discover that. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Stepping rotor action. Yes, so the rotor setting was changed daily. Um, there was the random wiring within each rotor that made it more uh, difficult to, to figure out. The ring setting, and you could also rotate uh, the alphabet on each ring so it would be different to the relative wiring within, within each uh, rotor. And then later models had a reflector wheel, which was added on at the end here, which remained fixed. And that simply bounced the signal back through, um, always in the same way. And that was another weakness that allowed the code breakers to, uh, to figure this out, because what that meant was that no letter could ever encrypt to itself. So using some mathematics and some hard work, uh, the Polish were able to, and they got their hands on an Enigma machine, which was also extremely helpful. And then they passed this on to the British when they were about to be invaded. And then the folks at Letchley Park were able to do their work. Um, a couple of things about the messages. Um, the maximum message length was 250 characters, because when you're encrypting something, the longer the message, um, the more chance you have, because the settings remain the same for the machine within each message, the more uh, opportunity there is to discover correspondences and to break the message. So the shorter the message, the more secure. Um, yes, I think that's about all I wanted to say about that. Uh, any more photos? This just shows a typical process, typing the letter, bounces through the wheels and comes out here. If I type an A one time, it might come out as a G. If I type another A, it's encrypted to another letter. So that's basically how it worked. So I thought, okay, um, how can I make a piece out of this? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have uh, basically, the idea I'm coming up with is I have sort of three elements to the piece. Um, I've built a rotor model in Super Collider which at this point is just um, a very simple, as you see in the post window there, it's very quickly going through a four rotor model all the way to the end so that it starts again at the starting position. Um, this is doing it rather quickly. I think for my piece, I'll make these settings uh, occur once every 1.3 seconds. I know I want my piece to be 14 minutes exactly, because I also have a soundtrack element um, that I'm busy composing based on a 14-minute improvisation I did with some friends last year, um, which I'm cutting up. Uh, it's on two-track magnetic tape. I'm cutting up the uh, audio tape uh, based on a permutation sequence of five different lengths, which are then permuted over 120 permutations so that they're all achieved. And that turns out to be exactly uh, 14 minutes. So there's the soundtrack element. Um, and then the rotor element um, will be on the piano keyboard. I think I've, I'll divide up the keyboard into four different regions representing each of the rotors. 
And then there'll be musical elements that correspond uh, with each region as the rotors are turning, so to speak. Um, yeah, I'm still in the process of developing the musical material. I'm not sure yet if I want there to be sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence with character to note, which I'm not as attracted to, but it, I, I need to experiment with that. Or perhaps each rotor setting is a unique short musical gesture so that as the piece sort of evolves and all the permutations are performed, then you get constantly changing registrations, constantly changing harmony, and also perhaps building in silent settings so that you get some different silences and, and things happen. <laughs> Yeah, in a way. And this is the challenge as well, because you can you can make a really boring piece this way. So yeah, it's you have to choose your material carefully, I think, um, obviously. The third element is um, a video, which I'd like to show. And I had the idea of setting some kind of a larger flat screen TV on top of the machine facing the audience um, that would show an actual Enigma message. Um, and I have a couple of those here. Entire message. Always sets of five characters grouped in four lines and never longer than 250 characters. So I think it might be quite nice as well to have um, these letters appearing sort of rather bold on the, on the screen, maybe with a typewriter sample or something that's coming across. So this is a three-part message, which was decrypted to look like this. I'm not exactly sure yet what um, the harmonic think these three elements could be really effective with the video, the sort of uh, background soundtrack which will be playing throughout the piece as well as the, uh, the disc club ear sounds. In a way, I sort of I feel like I should. I need to figure out a way to either have uh, the actual plain text, you know, the the coded message. Maybe that also appears on the video, or yeah, there's lots of different elements that I need to find um, find a solution for. But.